we all know as employers that the more time we spend on prevention, you will spend less time uh, on COVID-19. So the more effort you place and placing formal protocols before employees return, you will spend more, less time on the COVID-19. So make sure that you take the time to have a formal approach so that you can reduce your and minimize your risk and exposure. Uh, and the prevention, if you spend the time on prevention, it'll pay off in the long run. And as Vince has mentioned, we certainly want to focus more on the prevention side. So social distancing has by far been the largest topic of conversation. Uh, we've all uh, had to adhere to some of the guidelines and the mandates by the state. Um, but really what it means is, you know, avoiding large gatherings and maintaining distance from one person to the next by at least six feet or two meters uh, whenever possible. So the next few slides will detail a few of the um, practices and best practices you can put into um, your guideline moving forward. So when it comes to some of the details in social distancing, um, I think it really depends on your work environment and how you go about you, you know, doing your job. And so some areas, uh, these examples might be you know, quite simple to work with, and there may not. Maybe you work in a warehouse where, um, or uh, maybe you work in a, an environment where you can't be out of the office, or you have to be by the phone, um, or you have to be waiting for customers. So, you know, some of these things might work, uh, some of these things might not work, but at least it'll get you thinking. Um, so, some of the things that we've thought about that you can incorporate as a best practice would be flexible. A rotation work hours, so maybe morning and afternoon hours, alternating workday rotations, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, you could also consider restructuring office seating, uh, making sure they're six feet apart, um, and then even consider uh, telework, right? You can be flexible in having your employees work from home. Um, and again, there's some other parameters around that, so security, um, ergonomics, right? other things that you need to consider, but you want to make sure that you have all options available uh, so you can reopen your business safely. And uh, these set of examples um, are more for shared or common areas. So if you have a, a waiting area, uh, maybe folks can't loiter or you make sure it's by appointment only so they're not hanging around. Uh, if there's restrooms, depending on what size, how many individuals can be in there at a time, maybe one or two only. Uh, lunch room and break room areas might be, be based on size, maybe only one person at a time in a break room if it's small, or maybe, uh, and so that'll require you to stagger breaks, right? Um, lunch room, same thing, that might need, require you to stagger breaks, and maybe spacing between seats and tables where folks can sit. So again, these are just some best practices that you can incorporate uh, doesn't mean it might apply to you specifically, but at least it will get you thinking about how to incorporate that um, within your guidelines in your back to work plan. And finally, the last set of best practices uh, pertaining to social distancing um, really reflects the interaction between customers or visitors to your place of business. And so you really need to have a good set of guidelines as to where folks should wait or drop off items. And so we encourage you to adopt technology, right? Because delivering services remotely might be the best option uh, where they might have a no contact policy where they'll leave your item at the door in the lobby. Um, if you have a, let's say a delivery and receiving area, uh, do you have guidelines where that might be disinfected or cleaned periodically because it's a high traffic or high touch area. So managing and controlling and having a center area for that will be important. Um, and let's say, for example, you might have a mail room. So how are you managing, um, you know, incoming mail or outgoing mail? Um, are you having visitors walk in um, or are they leaving it in a certain area? Is it is it being disinfected before you distribute it throughout the office? And so 
we really hope that these last set of examples really allows you to add to your current uh, back to work plan or even add a new section there. Temperature checks have been kind of one of the more, I've seen a, a more frequency of discussion on, on temperature checks recently. On March 18th, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission gave the green light for uh, employers to take the employees' temperatures. Um, you know, you, you know whether you mandate it or you do self-checks, it's really going to be up to your company to make that decision. So right now, our company is looking into uh, thermal uh, temperature checks before they come into the office. And so there are companies out there right now that are s selling these products and uh, companies are currently looking into it. Uh, you don't have to get a thermal thermometer. There's other types of devices out there that, uh, such as the forehead uh, temperature check or thermometers. So you wanna make sure you have the devices because they're hard to get as well uh, before you open up the office. So whether you're mandating it before they come into the office and you become responsible or you hire a vendor that would take the temperature checks for you. Um, there's also self-checking. Um, I'm not sure how effective that will be other than if the employee starts to feel ill, uh, you have the thermometer available for them to take their temperature. Uh, the, the whole point is you don't want them in the office or in your operations with a fever. I think where, where most employers are gonna be challenged with is how do you know the person uh, has a temperature or not, um, especially if you're encouraging everybody to come back to work, especially if uh, they do not have any sick leave or vacation left to take. Uh, these are things that you will have to consider uh, because um, the employee would feel uh, that they need to get to work sick or not. So how do you control that? So remember, some people with COVID-19 do not have a fever and some people with a fever do not have COVID-19. So the question becomes, so what do you do? Well, it goes back to what we've been discussing with you today is focus on the prevention. Prevention is the key to reducing and minimizing your exposure to COVID-19. The next topic of prevention you could include in your back to work would deal with mask guidelines. And if you already have personal protection equipment guidelines, you can certainly adopt some of these practices to include within your own current policy, because there might be positions where folks have never worn masks before. So you'll need to include that population in your new guideline. But what if you've never had to offer PPE to employees? This is where you decide what's best for your company or your organization. Now, if you're gonna provide masks, there must be some type of protocol compliance with that. So you certainly need to educate and train your staff on how to wear it properly or how to dispose of it properly. Right? Along with the compliance piece, you need to document. So in order to be consistent across the board with all employees, documentation will be very helpful. Now, the state has asked the general public to wear cloth masks, and so it can be confusing at times. And the CDC has done a really great job in showing people how to make cloth masks and why masks are important for safety. And so you can certainly adhere to that, but we want to make sure that you understand that whatever path you take, we ask and we encourage you to have a protocol and then just adhere to that protocol and be as consistent as possible and provide documentation if asked, just in case something might come up at a later time where someone said, hey, I wasn't asked or told to wear a mask at work and now I'm sick. So again, if you're going to ask someone to wear a mask, 
please be aware that it does come with some compliance. Um, and if you're not going to, again, you want to also be aware that it also comes uh, with some compliance as well. Along the same guidelines as with mask protection, you know, cleaning and disinfecting is a really important topic. So we would like for your guidelines or your back to work plan to incorporate a few of these ideas. So if you have quarter services, do you increase the frequency of cleaning common areas or reception areas or high traffic areas? Do you use a vendor to spray down certain areas of high traffic or just in general? Uh, maybe your employees clean throughout the day to help. So what areas do they clean? And how frequently do they clean those areas? Uh, think about break rooms. How many people might touch a microwave or how many people might touch elevator buttons? You also want to make sure that employees are frequently cleaning their own personal space. So their workstations or keyboards, uh, telephones, and, and you want to also make sure that there's a protocol for cleaning common areas like printers or fax machines and those types of items. And you really want to ask your employees not to share personal items. So we want to try to mitigate that as much as possible. Um, so don't share your phones or don't share other tools. Uh, but if you need to, just make sure there is a procedure to clean and disinfect them before and after. And really understanding that cleaning and disinfecting are two steps. One, you'll use maybe soap or detergent and water, and that would be cleaning the surface. And then disinfecting the surface will require you to use some type of disinfectant usually will have a chemical in there that will help kill a bacteria. So two different steps there. And then finally, you want to make sure that you have access to these products. So if you're asking your employees to clean or help assist in cleaning, making sure you have enough products and they're accessible. 